I'm uh, Jen Morton. I'm the program director for the Department of Nursing, and I want to thank everybody for coming uh, to this today. We, we actually present this talk every fall, um, partly to just keep the um, idea of the Ghana program um, alive and well with our students. It's partly marketing, and it's a way to um, think about global health um, differently than, than perhaps what you've been used to. And we're very lucky today to have five uh, students that went uh, last May uh, on the experience. We, we had many more than that that went, but many of our students that go are either um, online students or they are uh, graduate students that are out on rotations right now. So, but we are lucky to have four nursing and one pharmacy student here, as well as three faculty, Dr. Nida, Professor Fox and Dr. Laham that also went uh, last year. So I'm going to start um, the talk by first um, really sort of differentiating what this experience is and what it isn't. And it's probably easier to talk about what it isn't first. And, and, and that would be, um, it, it's not a mission work. It's not mission work. Um, I hear that term a lot. and I. I actually don't really know what it means, but it's used very commonly um, for people that go overseas and, and do humanitarian work, which is another term that it's not. Um, we go out as health professionals in the United States and take care of people every day. That's humanitarian work. Why is it different if you go um, overseas and do it? So it's not mission work. It's not humanitarian work. It's not um, medical tourism, um, but what it is, is a learning exchange, and it's a learning ex exchange with some very important partners that we have um, cultivated over almost 20 years now. Um, the program's been at UNE for 12 years, um, and prior to that, it was at another university, and it, and it came here, and we're doing some really amazing things with it. Um, most importantly, um, the interprofessional makeups of our student groups that go and faculty groups, but the learning exchange and the partnership is probably um, the most important. So this cross-cultural um, exchange takes place once a year. Um, my colleague, Trish, Trisha Mason from the Service Learning Department, she um, coordinates a lot of it, um, and so she's going to talk about the logistics in a little bit. But getting back to the what it isn't and what it is, it, it really is predicated on um, uh, how we see the world. What, how, what, what does global health mean? And Abhe Bang, who is a uh, research, a community health researcher in India, um, very well known, probably said it best um, when he uh, described that decisions made in global health that are not grounded in compassion often become insensitive to the local needs. We must be sensitive to local people who are the recipients of global health care. To be sensitive, we need to have compassion, be good listeners, and believe in the importance of partnerships. So if you're not partnering with the community, it's, it, it's really ethnocentric. And what that means is that it's, it's really arrogant on our part. And so these things are very, very critical. And it really underpins how this program is designed. Global is all around us. Um, the most pressing world issues right now are these things listed here, these five things. And interestingly, these five things um, while they, it may seem like they're uh, most pressing and low resource parts of the world, they're actually really pressing here in the United States. Trafficking is um, um, a terrible problem right now. Universal health care, well, we just don't have it. Um, and maternal child um, statistics, um, our mortality rate is lower than some developing uh, parts of the world, or shall I say, um, middle resource parts of the world. Um, infectious disease isn't quite so bad, but chronic disease is a huge problem as well. 
diabetes, hypertension, uh, cancers, and so forth. Oh, I just wanted to point out that this map here, um, the green indicates um, countries where universal health care is um, present. So um, th there are some um, South American countries and some African countries that have universal health care, and we don't. So, um, Has anybody heard of the Millennium Development Goals? I'm sure you have. Um, they're dated now. Um, they were just updated in 2016 to the Sustainable Development Goals. But in order to talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, it's important to talk about how, these, how the goals originated. And you probably can't see this very well, but um, the, the goals were to eradicate poverty and hunger, to achieve universal primary education. That's grade one through grade seven to promote gender equality and empower women, to reduce child mortality, to improve maternal health, um, to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other infectious diseases, to ensure em environmental sustainability, and to think about global partnerships for development. And so the goal was that over 15 years, um, and these were developed at the United Nations, that these goals were going to be met. I don't think anybody really thought that they'd be completely met, but that they were, there would be some marked um, achievements. And this is just a small sample of the ch achievements that were derived from the MDGs. And I'll, I'll list a couple because what, what these achievements did was they informed the sustainable development goals. Um, for example, um, um, the proportion of undernourished people has decreased from 23.3% to 12.9%. That's significant. Um, primary school enrollments, again, that grade uh, one through seven, have increased from 83% to 91%. Literacy worldwide is up by 8%. The employment of women has increased from 35% to 41%. That's not all that impressive, um, but as you know, there are countries where women are not allowed to work. Um, there's a lot of work to do um, with gender equality. The under five year mortality rate among children um, dropped um, um, from 90 deaths per 1,000 live births to 43. So that's, that's really amazing. Maternal mortality worldwide has dropped by half. HIV infections um, have decreased from 3.5 to 2.1 million cases worldwide. Global malaria rate has dropped by 37%. TB prevalence has decreased by 45%. And the world uh, population, um, this is could, could be a little misleading, but 90% of the world population has an improved uh, water source. So while, while it's not perfect, we have seen improvements in sanitation and hygiene. And then internet penetration has increased from 6% to 43%. Almost half the world has access to internet. And what um, the students will tell you um, is that cell phones are absolutely ubiquitous. Every person, no matter what their income level is, in, in, in most of the world uh, has, a, has a cell phone now. So the sustainable development goals were derived from the Millennium Development Goals, and they were increased from 8 to 17. And um, I'm not going to go through each one individually, but you can easily look these up. You can also, going back to this last slide, you can find that fact sheet that has very, a, a lot more impressive um, achievements. But probably the most, um, uh, you know, ones I'm going to highlight, um, you saw how, how much maternal and child health improved and also infectious diseases. Now everything is coupled into uh, goal three, which is good health and well-being. 
and almost all of the other 16 goals are social determinants. And as you know, if you've had a community health or public health nursing, or public health course, I'm sorry, I, I go into my nursing mode and I, I talk about nursing, but um, all of these things are social determinants and social determinants inform health, okay? So we've got clean water and sanitation, we've got um, quality education, we've got poverty, we've got hunger, those are social determinants that all inform health. And so the United Nations really pulled together this idea that, that um, this, these, these goals needed to be related and um, really focused on the social determinants of health and health disparities. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So, one of our really amazing partnerships with this program is with the Ghana Health Service. The Ghana Health Service is the equivalent of our Department in Health and Human Services here in the United States. So it's a countrywide program that builds health programs for the country. And so their objectives are to implement improved national policies for health delivery in the country and to increase access to good health um, good quality health and services, and also to manage the resources that they have that are available for the provision of health services. Now, anybody have an idea? Um, Ghana would be considered a low middle resource country. So some parts of it have more of a middle resource flavor, um, and, and many parts of it are low resource. Um, any idea what the proportion of health professionals um, compared to the United States might be in a country like Ghana? What percent? Just somebody throw out a number. 40%? So 40%, um, that would be uh, about, about a little less than half. A uh, country like Ghana actually has 10% of the healthcare workforce that we have in the United States. Um, that's uh, per capita per person. So um, they, they have to do a lot with little from a human resource perspective, but also from a fiscal resource perspective. As far as the health professions go, they have many less types of health professions than we have. They have lots of nurses, again, still thinking about 10% um, of what we have, but they have nurses, they have physicians, they do have some physical therapists, they have some social workers. Um, emerging health professions in Ghana are um, uh, physician assistant and nurse practitioners. Those are emerging roles. But again, very, very few and very, um, a lot less per capita. One health profession that is much larger than in the United States is that of um, midwives. Um, as a matter of fact, they train almost as many midwives annually as they do nurses because the midwives do all of the deliveries. And we, we hope that, um, that mothers are having attended deliveries. Um, that statistic is increasing a lot, but uh, midwives represent a very large proportion of the health professions population. Other partnerships that we have, the, the seal on the left is UNE, um, but the seal on the far right is the University of Cape Coast, and that is a large uh, public institution that's about 45 minutes away from where we stay. Um, that also partners with us. We have health professionals from there. We have public health people from there that partner with, have partnered with us on research projects. It's a wonderful partnership and we're so fortunate to have that and that with the Ghana Health Service as well. Um, what we do when we're there is we function under the Ghana Health Service clinical guidelines because that's the right thing to do. Again, remember, this is a, a clinical partnership that we wouldn't want to impose um, um, Western um, uh, clinical practices that they can't sustain or carry out. That just wouldn't be appropriate. So we function under their clinical practice guidelines, which are an, which are an evidence base. 
So the goals of this experience, okay, and they're prioritized, are to provide students, faculty, and health professionals bilaterally with an experience that serves to heighten cultural sensitivity and expand worldview. I know that's a really like long sentence, but that's exactly what we're doing. Um, it's, it's also intended to provide health care and related services. We do a lot of health promotion. Um, and again, think about 10% of the healthcare workforce. They're not doing a lot of disease management skills. They're doing a lot of health promotion. And it, it's an impetus to really have a, a solid public health structure. And countries like this often have an infrastructure that supports public health in a really meaningful way. Um, so to provide healthcare and related services alongside the Ghana Health Service, and the University of Cape Coast to selected communities in the western region of Ghana. And then to collaboratively develop activities that improve the health of communities in the western region of Ghana. And that really um, speaks to some of the um, uh, health promoting activities that we um, engage in. So a little bit about Ghanaian history. Um, their, their primary language is English. Um, the country population is about 19.7 million. Um, the size of the country, it's about the size of Oregon. Um, the Portuguese arrived in the 15th century, um, and gold and slave trade attracted the Dutch and English and continued to the 19th century. Um, Ghana became independent in 1957 from the British. Um, Another natural resource in Ghana um, that you probably have on your cars is rubber. Um, they provide most of the ru rubber for Michelin and Goodyear tires. And they also provide um, a lot of the cocoa. It, I, it might be um, the majority of the cocoa um, chocolate types of things that, um, that are seen worldwide. Those are very big natural resources. Ghana is considered a low middle resource country. We're not using terms like, um, it's out of my head, um, third world. Third wo oh, it, makes, it makes me crazy. We're not using terms like third world anymore. And we're really not even using terms like developing. Um, they're very pejorative. Um, what, what the WHO and uh, United Nations are, are used for terms now are low, middle, and upper resource countries. And so a few other facts about Ghana before we really launch into um, the experience are that um, there are some major tribes. Um, the Akan tribe makes up 44% of the population. That's where um, the tribe where most of the people that we uh, care for and work alongside um, reside, uh, specifically uh, Ashanti. Um, the language is um, officially English. Where we are, which is quite low resource, most people don't speak English. Uh, most people speak the native language, which is Fonti. And then religions. Um, while this um, was taken from, um, uh, from WHO as the Christian being 60%, traditional African religions being 25, and Muslim being 15, where we are, it's almost um, predominantly evangelical Christian. So somewhere around 95%. We actually stay um, on the grounds of an evangelical uh, church. Um, and not because this is affiliated um, with a Christian or a, a Christian affiliation, but just because a site like this represents a, a site that can handle a large group. Healthcare in Ghana. Um, Ghana does have a national insurance um, program. It's not universal health care, um, but it was established in 2004. Um, if a person wants to buy into the insurance program, it's not through their employer, but rather they pay a fee for it. The fee they pay is in uh, Ghanaian CDs is about 25. That equates to, do you guys remember the exchange? I think that equates to about $8 um, annually. 
and it covers um, it covers some chronic disease. It covers um, a fair amount and does cover some um, medications. Uh, child and maternal care is free in Ghana. Um, in, free immun uh, immunizations are free also, but not always um, highly available. And so, um, you know, we, what we do is we spend about um, six hours um, doing clinical work every day. And we, um, this past year, we had, um, I think, 11 or 12 students that went. Um, and along with our colleagues from the University of Cape Coast and the Ghana Health Service, we saw 495 patients um, and had common diagnoses, common diagnoses that you see on the right side that are really the common diagnoses we see every year. Um, a lot of malnutrition and dehydration. And really think, um, go back to the sustainable development goals or in the millennial development goals and think about all this. Um, you know, the, the, the hunger, um, low back pain, arthritis, chronic disease, um, malaria, intestinal parasites, infectious disease. Um, cataracts um, are something that is very common in Ghana. Um, Ghana is uh, where we are in second day, it's, I think it's about, I heard this one time from a community worker, it's about three miles from the equator. So that kind of deep, close sunlight can really be damaging to eyes. Hypertension, chronic disease, wound and skin effect, infections, again, um, uh, infectious disease. Although we saw no wounds last year, that was crazy rare. We didn't see any wounds, did we? Oh, you saw one? So um, is this where you were going to take over? So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague that, that helps to um, execute this program with me, who's also been several times, um, Tricia Mason, Director of Service Learning. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. So it was really important to hear from Jen about what this program is and what it isn't. And one of the things that we hope to achieve through this program and through these presentations is sort of show you what it means to be a culturally proficient or sensitive provider uh, on a global scale. And as we know, not only is this important when you're going overseas, but as our communities are growing and developing and changing, the skills that you can develop and learn through an experience like this will also help you when you come back and you're practicing here and you're working in your clinical um, placements. So the University of Minnesota actually has a toolkit for global ambassadors where they discuss, you know, what are the competencies, what are those skills that are important to have if you want to be a globally proficient provider. Um, as Jen was talking about, understanding the global burden of disease, understanding what those are and having aware an awareness of those. Understanding the social and environmental determinants of health are also very important. And, and Jen really went through a lot of those through um, her part of the presentation. You know, health equity and social justice is a huge part of understanding um, global health. As you can hear, with 10% of what we have in terms of health professionals in Ghana, you know, the health equity may be different than what you're used to and what you're used to seeing. And so understanding those changes and those differences is an important thing. The social, cultural, and political landscape is another element that's important to understand. You know, when we're in Ghana, if you're going and talking with people, you need to understand sort of not only their religious background, the environmental uh, envir you know, situation, uh, as well as the political landscape in terms of them being able to follow through on recommendations that you may have. Having that whole sort of world global understanding of where people are coming from uh, is, is really important. Having ethical reasoning and understanding ethics. You know, a lot of what we talk about when students get ready to go to Ghana is being okay with maybe things being a little bit different than you're used to. And that, that's a huge challenge when you're um, going overseas. You may th see things that seem unfair or that you wanna change the system or you wanna help people. Um, but being able to understand all the things that come before that, it may just, feel uncomfortable sometimes, and maybe the students and faculty can and talk about some of the experiences they've had in the clinic that, you know, still practicing ethically and having ethical reasoning when things are a little bit challenging or hard uh, is, is really critical. So 
enhancing your skills in the following areas, and that's something I think that we really do um, very well as part of this program. We have a pre-departure orientation meetings where we talk about how to work as a team and how to communicate not only among ourselves but also with our partners. So we are very fortunate through this program to have amazing partnerships uh, with the University of Cape Coast, with the Ghana Health Service. We work with local pharmacists, local doctors, nurses, as well as what I'll, I'll speak a little bit further about our, our community health workers. These partnerships and communication among these partners is a really critical skill in, in the success of this program. We talk to students a lot about self-awareness and adaptability. Um, understanding your background and where you're coming to the situation from is really important. Using your emotional intelligence as part of your team and also interacting with, with partners and, and people. And being able to be flexible and adaptable. Um, you know, going to Ghana is, is sometimes challenging for people. There are situations that come up that you have to adapt to. And so these are skills that you're learning um, as part of this program that will be very important skills also through this program but forever in your careers as health professionals. So again, all of these sort of skills and competencies are things that you can gain as part of the Ghana Immersion Program that we have. Um, Humility is a huge factor. As I mentioned, communication, ethics, flexibility, the teamwork. I think you'll hear from our students and faculty that being able to work as this interprofessional team with, with not only students from UNE, but again, these colleagues and partners that we have from Ghana make this program really unique. It may be that other programs that you see out there, the team from a university goes and they only work together among themselves and they serve the population. This program is very different. We are a team with our um, local partners and, and colleagues and, and friends, and that really is a distinguishing factor in this program. It's a unique opportunity for you as students to get to learn from others from, from Ghana and to see how they approach things, to see their interaction with clients, to see their understanding of those social determinants of health, of those political, social, environmental um, factors that go into treating patients, and you learn so much. And so the other thing that this um, program isn't, it, it isn't about us going there and helping people. It isn't about us going there and showing them or teaching them things. It's actually about us going there and learning from them. This is a learning opportunity um, for our faculty, for our students, for our university to learn how well things can be done in a totally different paradigm, to challenge yourselves to treat people and clients without all the technology, without all of the resources that you're used to having, and how you go about doing that and how you think creatively and collaboratively will really help you with all of these um, competencies and skills that you can gain as part of this program. So this is an interesting and, and very important quote that I saw that I think is very applicable. Um, health science students that participate in global field experiences, such as our program in Ghana, um, they actually come back with an expressed interest in volunteerism, in humanitarianism, in public health. It's a very inspiring experience, and I hope your, the students will share with you how it changes your perspective and how the, the lessons learned really stay with you and, and really impact what you decide to do when you get back. Um, and these can enhance your ability to be sort of self-efficient, self-aware, um, and all of these important qualities that we talk about um, here at UNE in training future healthcare professionals. This just adds um, to those skills. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the immersion experience. We've been running this program for many years together, um, and I'm sure that many of you are curious about the details. Um, you know, it's helpful to have a little geography lesson often. Uh, so Ghana is on the west coast of Africa, right on the coast. We are in the towns of um, Sekundi and Takaradi, which are still urban. Uh, they are on the coast, but we also work within a number of more rural communities as well. Um, those communities where we have our clinics um, are Sekundi, which is our urban clinic, and we also go to Conservado and Diabani, and one other. Please stop. Please stop. Okay. Um, so you actually get to have an experience both in an urban setting as well as a rural setting. 
Um, and you can see sort of Secundi there down on the left hand corner at the bottom is where we are. It's Accra is where we will fly into and it's about a five hour bus ride um, to get to Secundi where our clinic and where we stay. So that's always an adventure, isn't it? So um, this year coming up will be our 12th year running the program and we've had um, over 250 students participate um, from nearly, I think, every single UNE program. Um, we've seen upwards of 3,500 patients throughout that time. Um, and then I'm missing the number at oh, the so bottom. The, those are the numbers insured. Oh, yeah. so the 795, um, Jen mentioned the the national insurance scheme. So every year when we go, we actually sign up the most needy families for the insurance program. We sign up the whole family so that they can get a year of insurance to address some of their most critical health issues. So again, we've talked about really what makes this program unique. Um, and we've talked about the model where we're, we're working as partners, we're working within the community, but also the setting and the environment. We are living right in the community. Um, as Jen mentioned, we are partnered with um, a church in Secundi, and, and that is so that we have buy-in and trust among the community. Um, we have Ghanaian food served to us um, from um, family members of the church, and students are right there. They're not in a hotel. They are really right there in the community, right next to the clinic. And so we hear the sounds, you know, we see the sights. We are really embedded as part of the community. So it is a very immersive experience. Um, we work with community health workers. So um, college aged um, individuals who are connected with the church come and, and help us as cultural brokers, as language interpreters, and they really have a huge part of our program. They are partners with our students and faculty in helping to run the clinic, in helping to provide a cultural overview. Uh, they're cultural ambassadors and tour guides, and really um, great colleagues to have. And, and that's something also that is unique, and those are, those are really important people within our team that work there. And then our clinics, as we mentioned, we have um, rural and urban clinics, and we do primary health care related, related services. Um, we work with a local pharmacy to provide the medications that we provide so that it's sustainable um, and, the, and people can continue to get the medications. Um, so it's, it's really a unique program, and I'll, I'll let the students also um, elaborate on that. Uh, I mentioned the role of the community health worker, Frank, up here. Uh, on the left is one of our community health workers that's been with us for the longest, and he comes back every year and is really just a wonderful um, friend and colleague to have working with us. And I've mentioned sort of some of the roles that they have within our clinic. Here's an example. So the trip usually lasts about 10 days or so, and here is a sample of the itinerary. It's very busy. There's not a ton of leisure time, um, and, and students actually, I think, prefer that. They want to be in the clinic. They want to be in the community, and so we have a lot of opportunity to do that. There's clinic just about every day, and students break up into teams oftentimes, depending on the numbers, and some will be in one clinic and some will be another. We visit hospitals. We go to the market and do some requisite shopping. Um, we visit Almina Castle, which is um, one of the late largest slave castles, and have a historical tour of the castle, which is a very somber and important element of our program. Um, we have lectures by local experts, and we get to do fun things, like sometimes we do batik or have drumming demonstrations or get to go to a soccer game. So it is not just a clinical and health experience, but you're also understanding and getting immersed in the culture as well, which is also really important, as we mentioned, to having these um, global understandings. So that's just a sample of, of sort of a week in the life. Um, and then maybe I'll hand it over in terms of expectations and um, the setting, the environment, and I'll have our students um, talk a little bit about their experiences, what was rewarding, what was challenging, and any other sort of elements that they might like to share. Is there, um, how about if I start with Molly and we can sort of, <laughs> Oh, yes, 
Yes, I'm Molly. I'm from pharmacy. Um, I think probably the biggest reward I got from this was a sense of gratitude. I got an immense sense of gratitude um, being there, coming home. Um, I don't, I don't know how to describe it really. Um, the first word that we learned was thank you. And I think that was really appropriate because like everybody in the community is so welcoming and so happy to have you there. And it's, you just feel so grateful for everything that you're given and everything that you have. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, Hi, I'm Lydia, I'm a nursing student. Um, I think that the biggest thing that I took away from it was we would go for walks in the morning around the community and we would come back and people would be lined up waiting for the clinic to be seen by us, which is a little intimidating at first, but when you're done with the clinic at the end of the day and you've seen every single one of those patients and they're all smiling no matter what their issue is or how much in, how much in pain they are, it's, it's a really, you really remember that every day. It never goes away. However many clinics you go, you still get that same feeling every day. Hi, I'm Corinne. I'm also a nursing student. Um, like Dr. Morin said, the Ghanaian population has about 10% of healthcare workers compared to us. So going into it, we have different style in general. But one thing that I thought was interesting is when we were doing our assessments on the patients, they would focus on the one or two issues that they really wanted to get across to us, and we were more focused on a head to toe, and they would get anxious, like, I don't want you to overlook why I'm here. So working with the community health workers and the patients, and then us being involved, we kind of found the balance of covering all the systems and putting the focus on their main issues, but then uncovering other things too. So it was a lot of give, take, and it was really full learning experience. Hi, I'm Annie. I'm a nursing student. Um, one thing we made sure we did every day was after clinic, we would um, sit down with all the health professionals that we worked with that day and we would go over like the critical patients or people that we saw that um, we would want to like talk about throughout the day and why, like sometimes we would be like, well, why couldn't we do more and just like talk about their limitations and what we, how like what we did do made a huge impact even though we wanted we always wanted to be able to do more, but um, just like going over how everything we were doing throughout the day was really very beneficial to these people, even though we always felt like we needed to do more. I'm Haley, I'm from nursing. I think the biggest thing that I took away is a new appreciation, not only for what we have here, but also what they can do with what they have. Like I go to clinicals now and I'm like, wow, there's so much waste but we're also so fortunate to have all these supplies and resources and professionals to work with. And we went and visited the hospital and it's totally different. They don't have that stuff. They're using what they can get, but it's super impressive that they're still able to care for their patients the way they do. <laughs> Pass it on over. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Nida and I'm faculty in the College of Pharmacy and this was my first time going and it was so wonderful. Um, I agree with what Haley said about the sustainability aspect. I think that that was something that I took as well. Um, what was really great for me was that I learned so much working with the pharmacist Samuel there. Um, so when I arrived there, I met him almost instantly and we sat down together and came up with a list of medications that we were going to order. Um, and we had to do that several times throughout the trip um, to restock. And you know, it was great for me to learn um, you know, a lot of medications that we don't have here for different infections, but also um, they use different medications there to treat the same indications, such as you know, um, first line for blood pressure over there may be different than what's first line here. And so that was really great. And um, I think also in the sense of we would have to build up clinic every day and take it down every day. I think a quality that oftentimes pharmacists have is this like need to be like super organized all of the time. And it was really awesome for me to experience um, building something every day and breaking it down every day and really having to just work with what we had. Um, and the collaborative nature of it was awesome as well. It was fantastic. 
So I'm Kelly Fox, and I'm a faculty um, at, in the School of Social Work, as well as the Director of Field Education, and this was my first time in Ghana. And I think there were, there were so many things that um, impressed me along the way and that I took away. I think one of the things that I want to say is that watching our students learn during that 10-day period of time was amazing seeing what our students knew, what they were capable of, um, watching you work with the, um, the healthcare workers and work through translation when you never even really knew what was coming through, um, I thought was pretty impressive um, because the healthcare workers are not trained as interpreters. They are healthcare workers. They're, they're your young men and women who were there donating their time to us, um, which was just, um, which was amazing. I think learning from my faculty, um, uh, colleagues of, of what uh, they they bring to the healthcare profession was pretty amazing. I learned more about bodily fluids than any social worker should ever have to know, um, honestly. <laughs> you can all vouch for that, I'm sure. Um, you know, there were so many things as a social worker really looking at the social determinants of health and, you know, watching as our healthcare uh, workers, the you know the, the the docs and the nurses and uh, really, you know they understood and and recognized the social determinants of health and there was no conversation about it. And of course, as a social worker, I wanted to have lots of conversation about those things, but um, it wasn't necessarily appropriate. It was just sort of somewhat understood. Uh, and I think the other part for me as a social worker was really looking at the things that were um, that, of course, from my white you know, Western perspective thinking, oh, if we just did this, this, and this, and this, we could solve all sorts of problems. Um, and then stepping back and going, wow, after 30 years in the field, I still have some of these ethnocentric kinds of things that I need to step back from um, and recognize. Uh, and I had some great conversations with our social worker um, student who was there about some of those kinds of things as we moved in and out of that kind of recognition of, of, our, of ourselves. Um, and how we could really be helpful. I think one of the um, finest moments for me was there was a, I think we were in, were we in Diabni where we met the, health, the mental health worker? Yes. Oh, so I met, we, we were in Diabni and the people were, um, were waiting outside in this cover, uh, uh, covered, uh, uh, like sitting area. And this woman came from the community center and she was, she sounded like she was preaching. And she had this audience just captivated and I could not figure out what she was talking about. And then had a chance to talk to her. And she was a mental health worker um, from the community, basically a social worker. And she was doing health education and promotion around mental health issues and mental illness and about, um, uh, about uh, dementia. Um, and she was just getting audience participation. It was just, it was a, an amazing moment. And I can't wait to go back so that I can talk with her more. So. It, it also um, represents a paradigm shift. Um, it represents a huge paradigm shift in the, uh, that mental health issues are not so taboo anymore. 10 years ago, people wouldn't be talking about it. And the fact that there's health promotion surrounding it today is um, such a wonderful thing. Hi, I'm Dana Lawham, and I, it was a gift. I, I'm not gonna be as eloquent as everybody else here. I think everybody has pretty much said what's in my heart, which was, it was amazing. Um, it was a gift to me. Again, taught me so many things. I've been alive for a long time, and and still have a lot to learn, and I learned that. But the people were just the most kind and, and giving people, and it was just a pleasure and a gift to work with them. Um, it was a gift to see our students, um, and just that they were amazing. Um, they, they made us proud, and that was really amazing. It was a gift to, to meet new colleagues and get to know them better. Um, and, and to learn the healthcare system there. I, I remember when I first saw the providers, because I'm a nurse practitioner, um, well, years back, anyway, and to see the providers, and at first I remember thinking, gosh, I just don't see them doing a lot of touching and assessment. 
and we're all about assessment, you know, and, and I thought, gee, that's really strange. Um, but I came to learn over that time that there are so few of them, they've got to keep it rolling and they have to, um, you know, they have to gather information historically. They might listen to the lungs or what have you, but they've got to keep people moving through. And so they are going to make a diagnosis based on what they, they see and, and hear. And, you know, that's, that, that is their system. You know, it's, you know, far be it for me to change what they need to do and what works for them. But, you know, there were a lot of those moments. Um, you know, seeing how well they do. I remember we, we toured a hospital and, and uh, we were in the emergency room and, and I think it was the lead doctor or somebody kind of put me on the spot and said, you know, well, what can we do better? And, you know, my, my feeling was exactly what he, one of those folks said was, you guys are doing an amazing job with what you have here. Keep doing it because they are, it's, it is amazing. So anyway. So lots of rewards, but there certainly are challenges. And, um, and I, you know, I, I can tell you a little bit about what I've seen over the years, um, but I think mo the most powerful stuff comes um, from the students. And I want, want them to be very honest because you need to know about the challenges and not be um, blindsided <laughs> by the experience. So does anybody, anybody want to talk about challenges? Yeah. It's very hot, hotter than you would expect. I wish that I knew that before I went. Um, I think that a challenge at the same time as something that's really educational is working with the translators because they're not really translators but they have to do that for you so you're trying to not just talk to somebody about basic information but gather information about symptoms and push them through to create a diagnosis so using a translator for that is really beneficial but it's also a learning curve for sure but I'm glad that I did it and it's gonna help all of us in the future using translators but it's hot <laughs> um, Another thing that you should know is that your electricity and plumbing is not always guaranteed. Um, you make it work, it's not a big deal, but there were days where we didn't, can't just hop in the shower. We use rainwater and buckets for five days. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have AC. And sometimes the fans don't work. <laughs> but it's, it's all part of the experience. Um, one of the biggest differences was how religious they were. And so kind of be prepared to be hounded on like what religion you are, why you're not religious, like um, being someone with tattoos, like why would you do that to your body? Just like kind of know like they're very, um, it's just very different for their views and um, why we aren't as religious as they are. We found out after our first day of clinical that tattoos aren't quite a thing piercings aren't quite a thing and just ironically owls are a sign of evil and probably like three people had owl scrubs tattoos piercings <laughs> but nobody said a thing they were all just so happy for us to be there and helping and it just showed that like our differences didn't matter in this setting and it was it was beautiful I didn't hear the thing about the owls <laughs> I had owl scrubs <laughs> yeah um, Everything they said, I, I completely agree with. Um, the translators, as, um, I've, I mean, I've been abroad and I've been the minority, but this was the first time that I was the person who could only say, okay, thank you. And it was a, quite an experience for me. And now I, I'm definitely more of an advocate for using translators in the healthcare workplace now, just in our community. I would also add that, um, you know, especially um, uh, as it's an urban area, that the air quality um, can be a little, um, heavy. little what? Heavy. heavy. Um, not only from burning and um, that and pollution, but also dust. Um, the some of the roads are paved, but there's a lot of kick up dust, and so the air quality can be challenging as well. Um, and just to speak a little bit to Annie's point about um, the religion, you know, students um, 
are often surprised about how um, spiritual um, the community is, and and they are um, very much they get get a lot of strength from their religion, and it really gives them a lot of resilience. And so, um, you it's one thing that I I find every year that people aren't prepared for that level of commitment. And in, in some respects, um, to be very honest, people might find it a little coercive, um, but it is something that gives the community great strength and they, um, it, 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 they're incredibly happy all the time. You rarely see people that aren't just full of joy. So. So you can see from the comments of our students, too, how this experience has helped them become more globally proficient. And it's, it's always an honor to hear from our students and what they gain and what they learn from the experiences. So thank you guys for sharing. So just to give you the, the real details, um, should you be interested in participating in this experience, we will be traveling in May, and the departure date will be either the 19th through the 21st and coming back on the 30th or 31st. And that is based upon sort of flight availability and cost. And it will be after graduation, but what we try and do is look for the most cost-effective flight. Since the cost of the flight makes up about 75% of the cost of this experience. So we try and minimize and try and find the best um, option for flights that we can. Uh, there is an application deadline, which will be January 15th, uh, and it will be the 21st for PT students who are coming back a little bit later. Um, you will need a passport to apply. Um, we have to get visas for Ghana, and oftentimes uh, the flight to reserve a flight for you, you need a passport. So if you don't have one yet, I would recommend starting that process. Um, the cost of the trip is more or less around $3,000. Some years it has been significantly less, and other years it has been significantly more. Um, we have found the May dates to be more a cost-effective time, and so that is sort of the cost of the trip. And what that includes is basically everything but your shopping. So you'll have your flight, you'll have local transportation, you'll have room and board, you'll have cultural activities, you'll have your laundry done every day for you. Um, Really all the funds that you need to bring are the wonderful shopping opportunities that there are while you're there. I am delighted to tell you that there are three scholarship opportunities for this program. Uh, there is a dedicated endowed scholarship um, from the husband of an alumni of UNE that is um, very generous and so students are able to apply directly to that scholarship for Ghana only. And then there are two other scholarship opportunities through, if you're a graduate student, the graduate programs um, have a GAPS award, which is usually anywhere from, I think, $200 to $500, and you can apply for that online. As well as our Global Education Office, you can apply for scholarships through there. I encourage students to apply for all scholarships. Um, I feel like it's a worthwhile endeavor to put the paperwork together and submit those to have a significant portion of the cost for your trip paid for. There are a couple of additional expenses um, to plan on. Again, if you don't have a passport, the visa cost is about $100, and then you will also need immunizations and medications to take with you to Ghana, and those can sometimes be um, a significant cost. I'm happy to answer questions about you know, specific costs and things like that. I will tell you that space is limited. Um, we have found over the years that a smaller group is better for everyone, um, both in working with a team to have adequate supervision, um, and so space is definitely limited. So not everyone gets to go participate in this experience, which is unfortunate. Um, but if you have um, questions, uh, we take early applications. If you want to chat with um, Dr. Morton or myself, we're always happy to talk with students in more detail. Um, so we thank you for coming, and we'll also take, this is the website if you want more information. Presentations are on there. There are blogs. There are pictures. There are the itinerary. There's packing lists. There's all kinds of wealth of information that are on our website. So um, 
So does anyone have any questions either for myself, Dr. Morton, or any of our students? You know, they're here as a resource for you. We find that they're the best uh, marketers of our program because they've had the experience and can answer those questions probably more honestly than we can. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so we have a, we have a mic coming around to you. I was just wondering if you could kind of go over the um, process of the application um, and how you select students. Sure, so students submit an application. As part of that application, there is an essay that students write. They also get faculty recommendations. Um, they submit a resume uh, as well as um, a transcript. And so those applications are reviewed. And I would say that the most important element of your application is actually your essay to demonstrate how you want to gain these skills of a globally competent professional, how, what you have to offer to an interprofessional team. Um, you know, I think that the strength of your essay and the, the genuine enthusiasm and thought that you put into it is, is basically what is mostly the deciding factor, but then also faculty recommendations play into uh, it as well. Depending on the number of applications that we get, we may also do interviews if there's a significant number of applications. hope that, that answers the question. Any other questions about process, about experience, about from our students who have been? I just have one more thing. I, and I'm really, um, I don't know if I'm surprised, but I'm surprised that the students didn't mention the food as either a reward or a challenge because um, it, it can be perceived in a lot of different ways. It's very different. Um, Ghanaian food is, um, has a very rich rice and bean um, uh, diet um, with very little uh, protein because protein's really um, um, a commodity and so um, it, it tends to have a lot of spice it tends to be it can be kind of oily um, and students can sometimes they really enjoy it and sometimes they really don't and you know one of the things that we're very uh, cognizant about is that um, people um, from the community um, eat to survive and that if if we don't enjoy it or we think we're not going to enjoy it, that we um, try not to leave uh, food on our plates and, and that we're very sensitive um, that way. But, um, you know, I've gotten used to it over the years. There's some things I definitely don't enjoy um, and I, I'm, I don't think I'm a picky eater, but um, the food can be challenging, but it also can be really good. Is that, would you agree? Yeah. Okay. Grapefruit. Um, pineapple, bananas, plantains, uh, avocados, watermelon, yeah, some great foods. And we do have, uh, they, students talked about the water issue. We do have distilled drinking water, all the water we need. Um, so there's never a shortage of um, drinkable water. Okay. Anything else? Another question up here. Oh, yeah. So, so there is electricity. Um, it it goes out frequently. It's um, it's a community thing, um, but there you know there is electricity. I would say that it's out maybe twenty five to thirty percent of the time. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Um, people bring their um, their computers, their phone, and with a British adapter, um, everything's uh, the, as long as it's grounded all of your things would be fine, yeah. So the other thing I'll show you to here, the picture on the bottom is sort of the sleeping arrangement. So everyone has a bed and it's sort of a dorm setting and we separate males and females and then we have the faculty in a separate room as well. So there's a bathroom to share with you know, a couple toilets, a couple showers, um, but just so you have a sense of the living arrangements while you're there. And it is hot, there, there are fans, there is no AC. Um, there are screens on most of the windows, um, but just to give you a sense. And so then the, the, the photo in the middle as well is the clinic. So we take over um, sort of the church 
during the day. And that is where we set up and break down the clinic and the hundreds and hundreds of people will come through that. And as you heard, they will line up before we open in the morning and they'll all cycle through there. There's a triage station and then they're sent to providers. We have a pharmacy station and that's sort of what it looks like, um, just to give you a, a more of a sense of that. And we also have more pictures and everything on our website as well if you wanna see that a little bit more. Yes, more questions. Is this community solely dependent on UNE? Is this community solely on UNE or are there other universities that cycle in when you all aren't there? So we are the only university that's providing health services that come in um, to this community. And what's really fascinating actually is we will sometimes write notes to individuals and we will see them the next year holding on to that same note of coming back and checking in with us. Um, and I think a lot of the practices we try and have and a lot of the treatment and the medications, we try and make it sustainable. So we're not going in and saying, here, start your child on these vitamins, and then they run out in 30 days. Um, and we'll write comeback notes on something as simplistic as a post-it. Um, we've brought equipment back for people. I remember one year we um, jerry-rigged uh, an albuterol spacer out of a toilet paper roll for a young girl. And the following year, we brought back um, a spacer, and they brought the post-it note in with it, with this beat-up um, toilet paper roll spacer. It was, it was just amazing. Um, we have brought back canes, wheelchairs. We, use, we try to bring equipment every year. Um, and, you know, while well, we're the only university that goes and partners to provide health care. Um, there is access for people, but it comes, it comes at a cost for them. Yes, other questions? Uh, so many of us are from the ABSN program, and we're actually graduating in May. And during that time, probably like, preparing for the NCLEX, um, are we allowed to go on this? Yes. And have ABSN students done that in the past? And yes. how have that? Yes. Um, Our social work student actually graduated yeah. today and then came on the trip. Yeah. So um, yes, the, the short answer is yes. Um, we um, need to work out um, the logistics of um, graduation and the, although it's not a, a credit bearing course, we do um, enroll you in a, in a non-credit bearing course to do this. So um, I, we have to look into the logistics of how that impacts graduation, but it's right after graduation. Um, so I don't, I, I don't think it, it impacts it greatly. In the past, what students can walk in graduation, they can participate in graduation, but they may not get their actual degree until in August. So it may, your certificate may say August on it, if I remember correctly. Um, but maybe that may change yeah. as well. I think, I think we have been able to work around that for nursing because it impacts licensure so greatly. Um, that we've been able to work around it. There are some, you know, not to get in the logistics of nursing licensure, but some states don't require transcripts. They just require the program director to sign off on it. So um, I have no doubt that we can work around if nursing student graduates want to go, that we can figure it out. Um, to follow up from your answer, do you, you said you bring in equipment every time you go. Do, are we able to make donations or do you Absolutely. do fundraisers beforehand? Both. So um, if you could just repeat what I say. Oh, or okay. oh okay. So um, fundraising, fundraising is a wonderful, is wonderful. Uh, way to collect things. <laughs> um, and also we utilize uh, Partners for World Health. Partners um, for World Health. We generally Health. bring students. We um, collect, we take an inventory when we leave and we collect a lot of things to bring. The inventory and when they leave. the students have. All the nursing students, because they were on campus, came and packed. Um, the nursing students pack for the trip, and they um, learn a lot of um, techniques in, in packing wisely, <laughs> removing things from packages and so forth. So, yeah. 
Any other questions? Yeah. I just had a quick question about whether or not College of Medicine students have participated in the past and what it might be like to add a program so their students could participate. They, we have had some College of Medicine students participate. I think um, the, it was, maybe five years ago was the last time. It's been a very difficult um, for their schedules. So um, every, every major is welcome to apply. You know, the other piece is that we have to have a balanced clinic. So, you know, we certainly can use um, um, nursing students and physicians um, to higher numbers than, um, than for example, um, PTs and OTs and social workers. But that doesn't preclude us from accepting more of, of a discipline that we use less. We, we want a balanced clinic, but we want the right people. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if someone, if there's an issue that's like larger than we could handle or something, like can you, they can patients be referred to a clinic or something? So, and I don't know, but perhaps we had some cases where I'm going to let the students talk about it then. Um, one of the biggest things that has stuck with me is we went and visited one of the government-run hospitals. So they do have hospitals that they can go and get care with, and that's where the insurance comes in handy. So when we pay for their insurance, they're able to go and get larger procedures done that obviously we can't do in the clinic. Um, and we actually paid for one lady who had fibroids um, to go and get a surgery done, and she was so thankful. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, she was like a, I don't know how old she was, 40s. She had young kids um, and she basically looked pregnant, like her stomach was huge. Um, and she, I think, had insurance, but it wasn't gonna cover the cost of the surgery. Um, and so the day that we went to the hospital, she came with us on the bus ride and we're all like, who is this lady with us? And found out she's the lady that we were paying for her surgery. And um, when Dr. Morton told her that we were gonna do this for her, she got down on her knees and was just like praising us, saying thank you. Um, there were also a couple people who came who like, um, I saw one guy with, he had broken his arm a few years past, so he just had like this huge mass where his arm had just grown around it. And um, he had come and I think he, we wanted an x-ray to see if there was anything like that could possibly be done. So um, I know a couple of times I think we paid for people to go get um, tests done and then come back with the results. Is this an opportunity for anybody in the dental hygiene program? I haven't heard anything so I wasn't sure. So we've had a couple of dental hygiene students in the past that have come and the, the need for um, oral health promotion has been really, really um, great. And so absolutely, I would love to see dental hygiene um, back doing, doing this. Um, it's been probably four years maybe, but we, we have had dental hygiene students. You know, it's really interesting because um, they're using, uh, t a lot of the community is using toothbrushes now, but um, much of the community still uses the tooth sticks, which come from a tree in Ghana that's sap, is, has um, properties that are like fluoride. And Tufts did a study probably 15 years ago comparing um, toothbrush um, Behavior, behaviors of tooth brushing with brushes compared to the tooth sticks, and the outcomes were better with the tooth sticks, which is really says a lot, you know. And you know, maybe the maybe the the technique wasn't quite right with the toothbrushes, but it, um, you know, there are there are methods that work really well with with some things, but yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I was just wondering, is there like a cap on how many people from different disciplines are allowed to go? Or is it like a ballpark of like how many people from each major go each year? Or does it kind of fluctuate each year? So, you know, it's hard to say. We, we, don't, um, we don't go into this with a cap. We um, look at our applicants. We look at the, the potential um, chemistry of the team. And we, um, we make disciplinary choices that are, that are smart for the group. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, there's always a lot of interest um, initially, and then for whatever reason, the schedules, the classes, a lot of people fall out. We haven't turned a ton of students away, so I wouldn't let the numbers and the uncertainty around that um, deter you from m moving forward with wanting to do this. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was really great. I want to thank the students for taking time out of their busy schedules to come, and faculty, and everyone for coming. And if you, if you are interested um, and you want more of a student perspective, I can ask their permission for you to reach out to them. I'm sure they won't mind. Yeah. Thank you.